Welcome to Mastara for the last of the remastered gazetteers. After this, I've got Dawn of the Emperors, the Creature Crucibles, and about 25 modules left. This, of course, is one of the most problematic of the gazetteers, the Etrugan clans. It's not problematic in a topical sort of way, but the book is considered incomplete. In fact, it was so rushed that it's no secret, the Word of God said that this book went from concept to print in about three months. It's not so much of an allegory towards Native American tribes, but more like a skimmed over cliff notes. Which means a large part of this video will be me covering the remastered gazetteer available at the vaults because otherwise I'd run out of things to talk about in about a page. I'm Mr. Welch, and today I get to showcase the fact that I'm 132nd Chiricahua Apache. Going off the original book, it's obvious that it wasn't ready for print. The font size is around 14 compared to the normal size of 8 to 10. The margins are 1 inch across the entire page, and there's 25% more art than other gazetteers, including full page art for no apparent reason. There's no mention of tribal leaders, monsters, or cities, or other bits of information that you'd expect to see in a gazetteer. The rules for the Shamani class are unplayable as written, with glaring errors like the XP chart starting off kilter to show that you started with 1000 XP at level 1 instead of just 0. And that was the most glaring error in the class. As such, the book is considered one of the worst of the gazetteers, but it gets a pass at the same time because it was only printed to terminate the series. To summarize the official book, the Etrugan are the descendants of the original Oltec and Azcan people before the majority of them were sent to the Hollow World after the Great Reign of Fire. They hid underground in caves while the world above burned, only to leave once the chaos had died down. There they split into five clans, the Seagoing Turtle, the Equestrian Horse, the Traditionalist Elf, the Cliff Dwelling Bear, and the Ferocious Tiger. They were led by Etrugan, a powerful mortal who arrived from the Hollow World to help them thrive, but after he left on his quest for immortality, Everything went wrong and the humanoids invaded and enslaved all the races. And they remained slaves for centuries before Etrugan returned and liberated all of them with the help of powerful magics he learned while seeking immortality. He drove out the humanoids and then raised the Great Plateau to keep the tribe safe from future invasions. Well, three of them. He sort of forgot the turtle and the tiger clans that were south of the plateau, but that was fine because nobody was going to attack them. Unfortunately, the immortal Atzantiotl, Trugan's greatest foe, was able to corrupt the immortal patron of the Tiger Clan, Daniel Tigerstripes, and turn the majority of the clan to evil, much to Mr. Roger's dismay. That's pretty much the entire story of the Etrugan in their own book. Their own timeline doesn't mention them for the second half of it, only talking about events in other lands. It says the four tribes live in perfect harmony without conflict. But that leads to quite a few problems, because the Horse Clan is obviously based on the Comanche, a tribe whose name literally means enemy in Paiute. That means being trapped on a plateau with no way off, you've got the Cherokee and the Navajo living peacefully with the tribe that proudly boasts that they do not play well with others. Worse, the Turtle Clan is completely cut off from their cousins by a giant cliff with no way to get up, but somehow they can communicate and trade with them without a problem. And like other books, this one is bottled up, so the Tiger Clan only attack their cousins, which are just the Elk at the top of the plateau and the Turtle to the west through the forest. The book has very little tension, not much in the way of conflict, and the happy natives live in harmony all by themselves, which makes for a really boring book. So it was updated. Right after Hurricane Harvey, I was trapped in my house and decided to fix the Etrugan book, with lots of help from Mastara fans and some volunteers from the subreddit Indian Country. While I do have noticeable Apache ancestry, I'm also 31 30 seconds not Chiricahua Apache, so I needed some help. Several of the volunteers were intrigued about writing a book regarding the various tribes from their culture, even though most of the people helping, well, only one of them was from one of the allegorical tribes with Tom of the Chinook. Marco helped with the art and much of the Aztec lore, even if his tribe was blood enemies with those guys for centuries. He made more than a few heads explode with his loud and vocal approval of the Spanish conquistadors when we were getting feedback on the book. One man's conqueror is another man's liberator. Regardless, we filled out the details of the Etrugan, added two new factions in the large open area south of the plateau with the Nunahe and the Lighthouse Expedition, Tying the Etrugan directly to the Fey of Tall Tales of the Wee Folk and the Hollow World. Because I love me some tie-ins. The theme of the Etrugan clans is now change. For centuries they've been in a bit of a cultural stasis because that's the way their patron immortal wants it. But societies that can't change become stagnant. One of the clans, the Elk, are perfectly happy with the way things are. But the horse are a warrior culture that wants to run free on the lowlands. The Bear clan can't stay culturally isolated right next to Derekin and the goods their merchants bring. The Turtle Clan is physically cut off from their cousins, having more in common now with the Irindi and the Sin than others of their own heritage. The Elk Clan is having to deal with the fact that the rest of the clans aren't happy with the status quo, and either let them change or try and force them to keep the old ways, a split that is tearing at their own clan society. Last, even the Tiger are experiencing problems of their own as there's a three-way power struggle between its leaders, while other members of the clan are realizing that their habit of making enemies is about to come back and bite them. 
Adding to the turmoil in the land are different groups have taken an interest in the affairs of the Etrugan. The Nunahe are a kingdom of fae that have taken up residency in the Singing Forest and are fascinated by the Etrugan, being old allies of the Confederation of Clans. The Hollow World Expedition is a much smaller group, numbering around 60, of explorers from the Land of the Red Sun who use a magical elevator to discover the surface world. Derekin has become partners with the Bear Clan through the use of the completely mundane but enormous world elevator to bring goods both to and from the plateau. Point Theopolis is a secret Thaetian military base on Roaring Surf Island, constructed with the help of magic as the island has no natural ports. There the troops keep an eye on foreign fleet movements, with a keen interest in the expanding influence of the Turtle Clan. The revised history of the Etrugan hasn't changed much at all aside from the arrival of the foreigners. They still found themselves attacked by the humanoids coming from the Broken Land. Etrugan raises the plateau and the Tiger Clan is corrupted as normal. But in 934 AC, with the construction of the World Elevator, the cracks begin to form with the confederation of the clans. They've always kept to the old ways, which was a series of laws that they were held to, though not all of the laws were practical to uphold, and for some of the clans almost impossible. Further contact with foreigners increased the stress put upon the Etrugan to keep the old ways, leading to the turtle to practically abandon their past laws, and the horse clan to start a plan to leave behind their cousins and seek their own way in the world. The religion of the clans, aside from the tiger who have rejected the teachings of Etrugan, include a lot of laws that when they were created were designed to protect them. Some laws are universal and still held up today, such as never harming a totem animal, prohibitions against inbreeding, and to keep a fire going at all times inside of a tribe's territory. Others are impractical because of the isolation of the Turtle Clan. As much as the others would gladly come to their defense, you're not getting a group of braves down a thousand foot cliff anytime soon. And others the clans have just started ignoring, like the ban on metal tools or the restrictions on arcane magic, except the magic that was taught to them by Etrugan. The land of the Etrugan are divided into two primary areas. The lands atop the Great Plateau and the southern forest to the south. The plateau has three distinct regions, the Three Lakes area to the northwest and the large forest to the southeast. In between these two areas are the Thundering Plains where the bison roam and the horse clan hunts them. Also living on the plains to the northeast along the cliffs is found the Bear Clan villages, though all of these are built into the side of the plateau as well. Another area on the plateau of note is called the Buffalo Home, a naturally occurring portal to the spirit world where all manner of animal spirits are found and the Etrugan stay well away from. Below the plateau, the clans control a small strip of land to the north, at least on paper, but the large swaths of forest directly south of the plateau are directly under the control of the Tiger and Turtle clans. Near the nation of Sindh, the foothills to the north are populated by a large number of pachydermians who largely do their own thing. The Singing Forest is home to the Turtle clans and the Nunahe. This is a large conifer woodlands with enormous trees and abundant wildlife. The Forest of Death houses the Tiger clan and resembles more of a tropical jungle, which shouldn't be supported in the climate it resides, but this is caused by the magics of Anse Antiotl, who has made the Tiger Clans resemble the Azcan nation that he first corrupted. Off the coast of Etrugan are three islands, only one of which is actually used by their people. The Island of Spirits is a mountainous island that is overrun by malevolent elemental creatures of air. In the middle is a portal to the Plain of Air, though fortunately for mariners, none of the creatures venture far from the island. Roaring Surf Island, again, is occupied by Thaetians, operating out of a fort in the middle of the island constructed in secret. They spy on passing ships and keep an eye out for pirates. They pose no threat to the Etrugan, being more concerned with the Irindi and the Minorthadian navies. Whalebone Island is the largest whaling station for the Turtle Clan, who share the island with the Irindi whalers. The two groups cooperate in this task, as the catch in the waters is plentiful. The coordinated industry between the two nations has led to great strides in mutual respect between the peoples. In the northernmost part of the Singing Forest, you will find the Eternal Powwow, where the Nunahe have created their own kingdom styled in the fashion of the Etrugan. Here the drums never stop, as the she and other fey creatures mimic the Etrugan in their own misunderstood way. Chief Haw Haw the Diagonal rules over the Nunahe and is the sworn protector of the Turtle Clan, whether they want it or not. The Nunahe dress in a manner akin to the Etrugan and arm themselves with similar weapons, though they don't have the same restrictions on metal that the Etrugan do. The plateau itself is largely mineral of poor, leading to the clans, apart from the tiger, having no access to most metals. While they have a prohibition over the use of metal weapons and tools, all clans except the elk are starting to question this restriction. The turtle clan has begun to abandon this law entirely, and the horse clan views metal weapons taken in combat as prizes. The bear has openly kept the prohibition, but there is a thriving black market thanks to their connections with the Republican Derrickan. Only the tiger clan will use metal weapons, but the mineral deposits in their territory is mostly precious metals meaning the weapons and tools they have are almost always stolen. Without common metal ores like iron in the plateau, the clans have no knowledge of smelting or forging, so all metal weapons found among the Etrugan are from another nation. Many of the common monsters found in the known world are largely absent on the plateau, except those that can fly. 
Humanoids have no presence in the lands of the Etrugan, though the plateau does host several large creatures like purple worms and at least one Hephaestan. While the Braves will try to drive away non-humans, these creatures are typically too powerful to be defeated and are left alone. The Elk are by far the most traditional of all the clans, holding closely to the teachings of Etrugan. They are found at the southeast of the plateau, living in the forest there. They consider themselves first among equals, the keepers of the old ways and the defender of the Etrugan culture. They have a bad habit of imposing their views on the two other clans found on the plateau, something that annoys the Bear Clan and irritates the Horse Clan. They are the largest of the clans in size, with eight cities in their territory. The Etrugan Confederation was founded in the Elk City of Ken Nashdulba, which serves as the center of the Bobcat tribe and the capital of the Elk Clan. Here you will find a city laid out by Etrugan himself, filled with temples to all of the Etrugan patron immortals, though the largest temple is reserved for Etrugan, and the Elk Clan's patron Mahmadi running Elk's temple is the closest to his. The Elk are the largest producers of food in the Confederation, growing all manner of food and luxury crops like tobacco. They also create large amounts of artistic goods, usually of a religious nature. The exotic foods and art they create would fetch a fortune among the traders in the lands below, but the Elks are the most isolationist of all the clans and refuse to do business with the Derrican merchants or any foreigners that approach them. Most outsiders are forbidden from even entering Elk territory. Though they are considered guests of the Bear Clan, they will be turned back without harm, most of the time. If an Elk suspects a Bear or Horse Clan merchant is looking to resell Elk Clan goods to outsiders, they will cancel the sale. Some Elk Clan Braves have taken it upon themselves to be moral guardians for the rest of the clans, and act as roving customs officials to check the visitors new to the plateau for items that are forbidden by the old ways, confiscating and destroying anything like metal weapons or holy symbols of immortals from lands outside of Etrugan. Not everybody in the Elk Clan shares this belief, though. The Al Tribe uses a loophole in the old ways to study arcane magic, using only the spells taught by Etrugan or discovered on their own. The wizards see that the clan is stagnating and are advising others to become more tolerant of outsiders. The beaver tribe has gone so far as to begin constructing a scaffold that will reach to the lowlands, allowing the elk clan to interact with the turtle clan without magic. Needless to say, this plan does not have the approval of other tribal leaders. The bear clan is in a state of internal conflict. It was considered the poorest of the clans, living in the most arid regions and producing little outside of pottery and a few crops. Derrickan changed all that when they offered the clan a fortune in trade goods in exchange for being able to construct the Great Elevator, a mechanical device that can raise entire caravans to the top of the plateau. Overnight, the Bear Clan found itself one of the richest of the clans, with the trade goods making the lives of the tribes closest to the elevator one of almost luxury. Almost instantly, the clan began making trade goods to send back to the Derrickan caravans, and even had hundreds of its people leave the plateau to live in the lowlands to maintain the trading posts at the bottom of the elevator. The wealth did not come without turmoil. The more traditional members of the Bear Clan were disgusted with how easily the youth of the tribe gave up their teachings to benefit from the goods and the materials provided by the men of coin. While some of the tribes have almost abandoned the old ways, other tribes doubled down on their adherence to them. What makes the situation worse is that the leader of the clan is an indecisive man who angers the poorer tribes with his noticeable bias towards the richer tribes. The fact that many of the goods designated to help the poorer tribes are taken by unscrupulous merchants and chiefs in the other tribes is infuriating the poorer tribal chiefs. The fate of the Bear Clan is very much in question. With many people abandoning the clan for the cities, the clan might find itself torn apart from the strife. The Horse Clan never wanted to be on the plateau in the first place. They view themselves as warriors. If you can't wage war against a foe, you aren't much of a warrior. In the days long gone, they would fight against the Red Orcs that took their names from the Horse Clan warriors. They would raid the cities of other humans and take down monsters for both fame and honor. When the plateau was raised, all the clan's enemies were suddenly left behind in the lowlands. Now all the horse warriors could do was occasionally raid the sparse farms of the Bear Clan or the distant cities of the Elk Clan. But they could not wage wars, that was forbidden. Plus they had to live with their cousins. Starting an actual war with them was not in anybody's best interest. The horse, unlike the other clans, worshipped a patron immortal before the arrival of Etrugan. Long before he arrived, Akati Stormtamer ascended to immortality and served as the only Etrugan patron. Under him, the Horse Clan conquered the other clans. Before Etrugan arrived, liberated everybody, and started the confederation we have today. Because of this, the Horse have always had a strong independent streak compared to their cousins. They view the Bear as too timid, the Elk as stodgy, and they haven't seen the Turtle Clan in so long they forgot what they originally thought of them. They have turned to hunting instead of warfare in the century since their isolation. Their hunts are almost military campaigns in their own right but hunting buffalo or the occasional flying monster like a griffin pales in comparison to writing down orcs and humans, but it will have to do for now. The biggest change in the history of the horse was the discovery of what was initially thought to be a cave, but upon exploration was revealed to be a tunnel carved by a purple worm in recent years. 
The Braves that dared enter the tunnel followed it for miles as it wound its way through the rock until it ended at the bottom of the plateau. A way down to the lowlands had been discovered. While many in the clan, upon hearing the news, wanted to leave immediately, cooler heads prevailed by pointing out the tunnel needed to be widened to allow the horses through, and the tribe couldn't leave without taking the bison with them, as that animal was crucial to their survival. A wizard was hired through a proxy, and now the clan waits with increasing excitement as the day of their freedom draws closer. If the Turtle Clan had close ties to any of the other clans in the Confederation, even they don't remember it. Located south of the plateau on the border with Sind, the Turtle have been isolated from their cousins for so long, they don't even remember why they follow the old ways. They have long interacted with the nations of Sin, Irindi, Menrithad, and Derekin, even building docks to handle large ships for trade. The Turtle Clan has become a bit of a cultural chameleon, stealing aspects from different lands to improve their own culture. They pay lip service to many of the old ways, while others they have flat out abandoned without apology. They don't use metal coins, but instead use paper currency like Derekin does. They traded with Alfheim for ironwood to use in place of metal tools and weapons for the few members that still use that restriction. Elephants from Sin plow their fields and work their shipbuilding yards. The original culture and traditions of the Turtle Clan have mostly been replaced or evolved into new ones because of their interaction with their neighbors. The question that the Turtle Clan will have to answer sooner than later is if they're even part of the Confederation anymore. Their location is cut off from physical interaction with their other clans. Their shamanic can visit the other clans through magic but the average member of the Turtle Clan will never see another member of the Confederation in their lifetime. They have built themselves up as a strong nation economically and can defend themselves with the help of their newfound friends. Turtle Clan ships are becoming common sights in the island nations, and Derekin and Minrathad are starting to become concerned about the Clan's growing economic strength and focus. At the same time, the Clan is looking hard at its own customs, leaving behind the ones they find obsolete. But they're finding it harder to object to leaving the crueler customs in the past. The Tiger Clan is in danger of self-destructing dramatically. Three men vie for control of the clan, trying to gain advantage over one another while the clan's numerous enemies are growing in strength. The clan is normally ruled over by a tribunal with the clan chief, the Viper, and the Tiger High Priests. In reality, the Viper High Priest has held all the power, leading the worship of Azantiotl. The Tiger High Priest leads the temple devoted to Danil Tiger Stripes and is important only because of his vast wealth that he gained through bribery. The clan chief has long been a figurehead, but the latest ruler wants to be more, and is plotting against both priests. Of course, the viper priest has expected this, and is looking to remove the chief in favor of one more pliable. The three men plot and conspire against each other, looking to remove or discredit each other in hopes of gaining total power. Outside the capital, the tiger clan is looking at foes in almost every direction. Once they raided the cities of Derekin with almost impunity, relying on their savage reputation and their lightning-fast strikes. But Derekin has adapted to the Tiger Clan's tactics, and the last major raid resulted in a massacre of the Python tribe's braves. Only the belief that the tribe had held braves in reserve kept the Derekin army from destroying them entirely. The Tiger have long been the enemy of the Nunahe, and with the Fae having grown tired of the constant aggressions, have begun taking the offensive. Even the Turtle Clan, a longtime favorite target of the Tiger Clan, has strengthened themselves with the help of their allies and the improved weapons and armor that their wealth can obtain. The Tiger Clan needs slaves to appease its Antiotl, and they're discovering that all the easy sources are drying up, and even worse, fighting back. A Trugan are fairly rare outside the region with the exception of the Turtle Clan. That's not to say you won't find them on the lowlands, but they're going to need a reason to be there. Fortunately, other than the Elk, the other clans do have some underlying reason why they want to travel. The Turtle Clan, with its abandoning of the old ways, is pretty obvious. The Horse Clan has a way off the plateau, but so far only small numbers of them have made the journey, mainly as scouts or to raid unsuspecting villages. The Bear Clan lives on the side of the plateau, and their sudden infusion of wealth has made several other clan want to see what the outside world has to offer. The Tiger Clan, despite its reputation for evil, does have members that don't share the clan's worldview. This isn't the healthiest attitude to have in the Forest of Death, so self-exile is often the better option. Even members of the Elk Clan could have a reason to travel, especially the Wizards of the Owl Tribe, but they will almost always be encountered individually. So why do you want to play in a Trugan? They're reclusive, technologically backwards, and just getting off the plateau is often an adventure in its own right. However, they're quite rugged and natural survivalists. They live through their wits and have a unique fighting style involving hit-and-run tactics. When you don't have iron, you don't have heavy armor and quickly learn how to dodge. That was a problem with the original book as their armor class was constantly borderline pathetic. The 5th edition book rectified that, but they will still need to be played differently as fighters in Beckme and in the rule cyclopedia. I normally don't rely on unofficial fan creations for videos, but the Etrugan book was devoid of things to talk about. You can find the revised Gazetteer books on the vaults of Pandius, and I'll add a link so you can find them. There's a player's guide and a DM's guide. 
They also have the corrected rules for the Shamani, which again were unplayable in the original book. There's rules for new magic items, new monsters, and a whole host of NPCs, and lots more. Check it out. A lot of people helped me with it, and I couldn't have done it without them. And before you ask me how to pronounce the city names that were provided for me in Navajo, I will give you the same answer I was given when I asked that question. You don't. Next up for remastering is Thyatis, as I'm splitting the box set in two. Until then, Pocahontas should have realized she was a side chick the minute the guy introduced himself as John Smith.